morning section. I just would like to start giving us uh, a warning about the, the cough break. We'll make it shorter today, like 15 minutes shorter, such that some of you are going to go back, take a flight at, at 12, I think. So we decided to make it shorter, but I, I'll repeat this again afterwards. So today we will have then the, the first talk from Johannes Zaya. <laughs> I was trying to, do, to say correctly, from Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics. So thank you, Johannes. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot um, for the kind introduction. And um, also thanks to everybody here uh, for um, staying until the last day uh, and making it to this talk, uh, like kind of early in the morning. And of course, also thanks a lot to the organizers to give me the chance to talk about our results, our work at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics and at the um, LMU in Munich. And what I will focus on today are recent experiments that we did on um, uh, looking at um, um, quantum systems, particularly Hubbard systems, using a quantum gas microscope out of equilibrium. And I actually have two parts in my talk. So first I will talk about uh, these Hubbard systems, and then um, towards the end I will also come to a new platform that we are setting up where the goal is to perform similar experiments with strontium. The first uh, experiments will be uh, um, that I present are done in, in a different species, different atomic species, namely rubidium. And you'll see how you can maybe find complementary uh, features of the two species that are both interesting in this context. But before coming to that, let me actually start um, at the basics. So let me motivate what we are doing, what we are after. So what we want to do in our work, in our experiments, is basically to understand, control, and create many body systems. And I think all of these aspects are important. So the understanding, of course, kind of underlies everything. But then we also want to use to control the new knobs, the new techniques that we have, the technology we have to um, control those systems better, and then to also create new states, new systems that we, that we can make use of and that have very interesting properties. And of course, these many body systems have impact on a lot of different fields, a lot of different um, areas. Of course, first of all, they're important for fundamental research. We want to understand what's going on in those, in those systems. We've heard many talks already here um, looking at that, sometimes using machine learning techniques, um, talking about uh, strongly correlated systems or um, transport. Of course, there's also a lot of interest in the new technological applications that come out of these many body systems out of the control one example being ITC superconductivity, and the other, of course, quantum computing. Um, one can also use those many-body systems in this context, meaning entangled um, um, states of many atoms um, to do quantum measurement, to improve quantum measurements beyond what's possible with classical systems. And last not least, um, a very interesting recent development is also to think about what happens if you take entangled or at least interacting a um, bunch of atoms of quantum um, 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 emitters, and you couple them, and you create new light matter interfaces. So you um, enhance and tailor your light matter coupling using interactions between the atoms. And all of these aspects are in some way or the other covered in the work that we do. Um, today, I will mostly focus on this uh, fundamental research aspect where we are trying to understand some of those systems at the basic level and also trying to engineer some interactions. Um, the platform I will focus on is uh, the platform of microscopically controlled um, um, neutral atoms, so microscopically controlled atoms either in optical lattices or in tweezers, and um, this can be sum subsumed in uh, what I would call atom arrays, so ordered arrays of, of individually controllable atoms. Um, so there are basically, and I want to give you this upfront, two experimental platforms that um, have you know, um, received a lot of attention in this field, in this uh, you know, um, um, uh, quest to study many body systems, especially with this microscopic um, control, which are on the one hand these optical micro traps where the um, current state of the art is to basically start with a laser cooled cloud and then you use individual control, individual tweezer traps that are generated using these um, um, spatial light modulators or acoustic optic deflectors to pick up individual atoms, space them at around a few microns, and then to kind of inter uh, let them interact via um, Rydberg interactions, for example, so long range interactions, and then look at spin physics or also do quantum computing with these. So you can also realize gates and such platforms, very high fidelity. I would say it's one of the leading platforms that we have today. On the other side, there's the more traditional approach of using 
quantum gas experiments um, to do quantum simulation where you start with many atoms and then you go to uh, many sequences of cooling steps. You cool the cloud from, you know, um, let's say essentially room temperature or even hotter to uh, all the way down to quantum degeneracy to superfluid and then you drive the system using um, optical lattices, for example, to quantum phase transition to a mod insulator and then you can use a very high resolution uh, microscope to look at them individually and also to manip manipulate them. In the first half of the talk, I will focus on experiments we did with such a quantum gas microscope experiment, and then later on, I will actually present this new platform using strontium, where we try to combine both of these approaches, and you'll see what new things emerge. So this is the program. As I said, I will start with some experiments that were performed in the quantum gas microscope, um, and the goal here was particularly to, to realize new types of interactions, which are extended range, so they don't um, only act on, on atoms that are on the same side in a lattice. And then the second part, I will uh, tell you how we can use strontium to scale such a system up. So uh, the first uh, um, uh, topic, uh, Rydberg dressed um, Hubbard model. So um, let me um, first motivate why we are interested in, in such um, Hubbard models or Rydberg dressed Hubbard models at all. So what are Rydberg dressed Hubbard models? Well, they are models where we have not just the bare Hubbard interaction, but we have a longer range interaction. And longer range interactions are very interesting in quantum simulation because what they give rise to is competing length scales. So I brought two examples that I think particularly nicely demonstrate this. On the one hand, on the left hand side here, um, we look at a one dimensional Hubbard system where uh, the atoms um, can hop on a, on a chain basically with a tunneling element T. When they're on the same side, they interact with the strength U. And when they're on neighboring side, sides, they repel with an um, extended Hubbard interaction V. So what happens if you uh, just look at the phase diagram is that if you have uh, no extended range interaction, so V0, you get just uh, this axis and you have two phases, the superfluid and the mod insulator. Um, but when you then turn on this uh, extended range interaction, you see that um, many new phases emerge, in this case this um, density wave ordered phase, and interestingly also this Haldane insulator that sits somewhere in the middle between the um, mod insulator and the density wave and has very interesting properties because it has this non-local order that even defies Landau's uh, um, idea of ordering phases. So this is really something completely new that you don't get if you just have the um, vehicle zero axis here in place. Um, similarly, if you consider now not a gas trapped in a lattice, but a gas trapped in a harmonic trap in this case, and you um, start from this, uh, um, uh, let's say, a short range interacting gas, what you have is a superfluid typically when you have bosons um, in, uh, with contact, weak contact interactions. And then when you turn on a long range interaction, what you see is that the superfluid uh, assumes or uh, picks up some density modulation that's just a consequence of the particles repelling and trying to minimize the energy, where in the extreme case you get like this crystalline-like ordering, but somewhere in the middle here, you also have a phase where both the superfluid character and the crystalline character um, are present, and this is a super solid phase. And these are two examples, as I said, where the long-range interaction really brings some very new physics that you don't have in the short-range interaction model. So that's enough motivation for us to start studying this. Before I go into the details, let me actually give you a brief uh, um, rundown on what the experiment is about or what this quantum gas microscope actually is. So in a nutshell, essentially the quantum gas microscope is a machine that is composed of a very good microscope and a two-dimensional system of atoms that is confined, in this case, in a three-dimensional lattice. Um, the three-dimensional lattice is of such a nature that in the vertical direction, we have a strong confinement and we can isolate a single 2D plane. And then in the horizontal direction, we have controllable lattice uh, uh, beams where we can change the lattice depth and control the Hubbard parameters. This microscope then allows us to achieve single atom sensitivity and detection, local resolution, and single atom control in the sense that when we look at such a, a gas, we can say for each and every lattice side, which is indicated here by the white dots, whether there's an atom on that lattice side or not. And we do that via fluorescence imaging and then keeping the atoms in the lattice during this fluorescence imaging. This is something that was a, a breakthrough that was achieved uh, in, in 2010, uh, among others, uh, by, by Christoph um, in, in Emmanuel Bloch's group and also in um, Markus Greiner's group at Harvard. So it was really one of the game changers, I would say, in this field of quantum simulation to date. Um, as I already said, what we can then do is we can use our horizontal lattice beams um, to, to realize optical lattices in the plane, and these optical lattices, um, uh, well, 
depicted, uh, as you all know, as, as these uh, periodic, um, uh, periodic structures where the atoms can hop. So this is a hop, this is just a Hubbard model. To very good uh, approximation, we realized the bosonic Hubbard model in our experiment, uh, which is written down here. And you have this competition between the tunneling amplitude and the interaction here. Just to give you an idea, uh, typical parameters that we can reach are u over um, h, um, in this case about 250 hertz. And then j can be changed quite dramatically because we can vary the lattice step to control the tunneling strength of the atoms in the lattice. This allows us, as I already was uh, briefly mentioning, to actually start, uh, for example, um, but after all of these evaporation stages um, with the atoms in a superfluid state, we get very cold clouds of, of atoms that are confined in this two-dimensional layer. And then we can re uh, increase the ratio between u over j but just by lowering or increasing the j, in this case, by lowering the j, um, and go from the superfluid to a mod insulator. And of course, this is very cool that you can see in situ with the single atom uh, resolution what's going on. And this is also, of course, um, say conceptually quite interesting also to connect a little bit to this conference here, um, because what you are getting here, if you repeat this experiment, is sort of a sampling of the many body wave function projected onto a local basis. And there actually have been quite some um, papers out already in what sense or in, in what, to what degree you can actually use that information um, also together with machine learning techniques to learn something about the many body physics in these systems. So this is, I think, a really powerful, uh, a powerful way of measuring systems. And and there are a lot, of, a lot of surprises, especially encoded, for example, in correlations that, that you can find here that um, um, you can also uncover uh, using machine learning. All right, um, very briefly, what uh, I also want to mention is that um, so far, everything I showed you was uh, assuming that we have a square lattice. In our experiment, we can um, also realize more um, complicated exotic lattice structures. We've built in a new uh, optical lattice recently. And so in addition to the square lattice, we can do square lattices with larger spacing. You can immediately see the impact going from a mod insulator here, where we have one atom per lattice side spaced at 532 nanometers to a larger scale lattices. Now you can really individually see these atoms. In this case, the spacing is 752 nanometers. And we can also use um, what we call side blocking mechanism to realize, in this case, a leap lattice. And here you have a, um, a mod insulator created in a leap lattice. So you have a lot of flexibility with these systems. You're not just limited to square lattices. However, in this talk, I will mostly focus on experiments that were done in square lattices, because that's the native implementation we have. Um, now, um, I was advertising basically that uh, we want to do long-range interactions. And um, so far, I've showed you the Hubbard system, where you all know that the interaction that we get is a contact interaction. So we only have interactions between atoms when they're on the same side. So how do we actually extend the, inter the interaction? How can we create long-range interactions? And that's one uh, experimental platform approach that has received a lot of attention recently, which is basically to use highly excited Rydberg states to go from these short-range interacting systems to long-range interacting systems. So Rydberg states um, are high-lying states that have quite extreme properties. In our case, what we do is we go from the electronic ground state in rubidium using a single UV photon into the Rydberg state. In this case, the principal quantum number we use is n equals uh, 30 or 31, depending, or sometimes also 40, depending on what exactly we do, but it's in that range. And what is important is that these Hutberg states now have extremely, uh, um, uh, let's say, exaggerated properties. So first of all, they're, if you want, very blown up versions of ground state atoms, because the electrons are so far away from the core, that also means they're actually very easily to polarize. And so this is kind of the, the property that, that makes them very relevant here. This polarizability actually also implies that if you have two Rydberg atoms in the system, they can very strongly interact. And this interaction energy scales with the 11th power of the principal quantum number, which means that if you go to moderate n, like the ones I just said, like n equals 30 or so, you actually get gigantic interactions even at distances that are a micron. Just to compare this with the typical energy scales um, that I mentioned before, um, this is you know uh, about um, five orders of magnitude larger than the typical hopping you have in an optical lattice. So it's really out of scale here. Um, there's also a problem, which is actually in this case um, um, uh, given by the lifetime, because if you excite a, uh, an atom to an excited state, of course, it will decay. And in this case, the Rydberg states have decay times of about 28 microseconds. And there you also have the problem that this is much shorter than the, um, the effective um, hopping time in the lattice, or the hopping, hopping time of an atom in the lattice. So it's not straightforward to use Rydberg atoms together with tunneling uh, dynamics in the lattice, because the, uh, the time scales don't match. And I will show you in the following um, how one can actually um, and fix this issue. Um, so what I just said can also be expressed uh, in this, uh, this so-called frozen gas regime. So typically when Rydberg experiments are done, the hopping does not play any role. And this is uh, 
this frozen gas regime that actually also allows you still to do many interesting physics. Um, I want to highlight one actually particular mechanism that comes uh, along with this Rydberg uh, interaction, which is actually a, a mechanism that is uh, very frequently used in the field, is the so-called Rydberg blockade, which uh, basically um, has its origin in this strong interaction. Say you start with two atoms in the ground state and you try to excite them at large distances, then that's no problem if the interaction energy is small. So you just do a resonant two-photon excitation. Um, if, however, you try to do the same thing for two atoms that are spaced by a much smaller distance, so uh, this uh, x-axis here is the distance between two atoms and um, the y-axis the energy, then um, you see that because of the strong repulsive interaction in this case between two Rydberg states, the doubly excited state is off resonant. You can maximally excite a single atom. And this leads to the so-called Rydberg blockade. So whenever two atoms are closer than a certain critical distance, the blockade radius, you know that only one of them can be excited. And in a many-body um, system, this would mean only one out of many atoms where this disk defines the blockade radius can be excited to a Rydberg state. And this, um, I should say, is also the basis of many very beautiful experiments that have been done in this field in the so-called frozen gas regime, where you now go and you encode a spin uh, um, in your ground to Rydberg state transition and you get a very strong spin interaction when two Rydberg atoms or two spin-ups in this case are close together. And one can, can, for example, look at ordering of these excitations, which has been done in very beautiful experiments in these Rydberg arrays that are uh, omnipresent at the, at the moment. And it's also the basis of um, quantum gates between two atoms using Rydberg states. As I said, what we want to do is we want to go a slightly different route. We uh, don't just want to do the frozen uh, Rydberg physics. We also want to connect it with itinerant, itinerant physics. So we want to actually bridge this gap between these very high energies or short time scales and the low energies and long time scales that we have available in the Hubbard physics. And we want to actually find this new physics that emerges like the super solid or at least phases where both this long range character or this extended range interaction and the tunneling dynamics in the lattice play a role. And uh, one example, as I said, is the super solid, but also the Haldane phase, of course, belongs there. And so the question is, can we actually do that? So can we bridge this, uh, this gap um, from the usual Rydberg physics regime to this Hubbard, usual Hubbard regime? And the answer is yes. What we can do, actually, is we can take the Rydberg interaction and play with it. And we can play with it in the following way. Namely, rather than going resonantly from the ground state to the Rydberg state, we can actually off-resonantly couple from the ground state to these Rydberg states with a detuning delta, which then creates a new state, a dress state, that can, be, uh, uh, can contain a small um, um, admixture of the Rydberg state. And the small admixture actually um, gives this new dress state a little bit of this Rydberg-Rydberg interaction. And let's see how this works. Actually, we can just easily diagonalize and solve this problem for a two by two um, system. So here you see again this bare Rydberg interaction, which is the one that you just have you know, um, when you do resonant coupling. And now if we go to the dressed basis, so we just diagonalize the full system, the dressed basis, you see that this uh, new dressed ground state actually also has a, um, a characteristic interaction. So in other words, the, the energy of the, the eigenstate, the pair eigenstate, depends on distance. Um, and it assumes this soft core interaction. So if you have two dressed Rydberg atoms that are far apart, they don't interact. But then when you bring them close, there's this characteristic soft core interaction. And what you, the way you can uh, understand it is actually um, intuitively clear. This is exactly the detuning here that detunes the doubly excited state such that your dressed state uh, or your, your ground state here loses coupling to the doubly excited state. And that's why the, the interaction energy saturates. And then for large, um, for large uh, distances, um, you have the standard um, two photon um, um, coupling that is on resonant. So we do actually get an interaction in this case. And it's actually much weaker than the bare Rydberg interaction, but it's still strong enough to be compatible with Hubbard interaction. The second thing that you get uh, in, in this case, in this uh, Rydberg dressing um, approach, is actually that, of course, uh, with this Rydberg state here, you also admix a little bit of the decay. So you also get decoherence. And the question in the end is whether you can actually get enough interaction while keeping the decoherence small enough to still do interesting physics. And um, I'll show you in the following that this is possible. Just summarizing quickly what we've done now. Basically, what we've done is we've um, started going off resonant coupling to the Rydberg state, not resonantly, but off resonantly. We get the switchable interaction. The soft core height here, so this plateau height, is essentially then uh, determined by the strength of the coupling and the detuning. It's still an extended range interaction, so it's long range in the sense of uh, which you would uh, call a Rydberg interaction long range. So it's characteristic um, uh, uh, length is similar to the blockade radius given by the interaction divided by the the detuning in this case, and you have this longer effective lifetime where the extension is essentially just given by the probability 
to find the Adam and the Rydberg state, or the inverse probability. So it, that your dress state will decay with a, with a lifetime that is given by the probability of finding the atom um, into the Rydberg state at, uh, in the Rydberg state at a particular time, multiplied by the bare lifetime. All right, so this is uh, uh, the trick that we are going to use. Uh, and uh, what we can do with that now is we can bring these two sides together and we can realize the extended Hubbard model, just basically now thinking about this V as this extended range interaction, which in our experiment, we now tune in a way that basically only for nearest neighbor, this V is non-vanishing. So um, this is a, um, the realistic uh, um, soft shoulder potential that we can realize in the experiment. You can see, rather than only coupling to one of the Rydberg pair states, you now couple to many of them. But the principle is exactly what I described in the previous slide. And um, of course, natively, we also have the other two terms, um, the uh, hopping and the interaction. And uh, now we have uh, control over all three of them, because the V can now be controlled by the laser power and the admixture that we have in the system. So <clears throat> this is the, the setup. I should say here, um, what we do is we realize several 1D copies that are identical, but for the following, um, I'll only consider physics in this 1D um, chain. Um, one important ingredient uh, that I um, don't want to go into detail about, but um, that we had to do before uh, we could actually realize this extended Hubbard system is that rather than turning on this interaction here continuously, what we do is we pulse it, and we pulse it in a way that the atoms that are tunneling that show this dynamics in the lattice, they effectively average over the stressing. So for, for each and every atom, the stressing, uh, even though it's very rapidly pulsed, it looks effectively like a, a, a continuous, you know, continuous admixture. But this was necessary to boost our lifetimes into a regime that are compatible with the tunneling. And we understand that actually uh, fundamentally because um, of the way the dressing scalings work, you can show that it's actually advantageous from, an ex from a fundamental perspective um, to do this uh, pulse excitation rather than a continuous uh, Rydberg dressing. Um, but what I want you to take away from this is actually that uh, what we can do just uh, you know, doing the stressing, uh, this, this pulse stressing, is we can actually extend the lifetime in the, to the range of hundreds of milliseconds, which is now compatible with the um, hopping and the interaction we have in the lattice. And so we can actually access this extended Hubbard range. And so we bridge these two, uh, these two sides or the gap between the two sides. All right. So what experiments can we now do? Uh, well, uh, we can do essentially two experiments. One is, uh, first of all, a quench experiment. So we can start from an initial state where what we do is we use the microscope to prepare uh, two atoms here in the center of a one-dimensional lattice. So this is the, the cartoon. And then we just let go and see what those two atoms will do in presence of this extended range interaction. And the second one is actually we can try to be more gentle and uh, prepare the system in a low energy state to start with, and then slowly vary, adiabatically vary the interaction and see whether we can realize low energy states of the system. So the quench would be a violent, you know, out of equilibrium experiment, and the quasi-adiabatic experiment would try to stay in equilibrium. And that's exactly what I'll, I'll, I'll show you. So first, uh, we look at the quench experiments. As I said, what we do is we take the microscope and we prepare two atoms um, at precisely controlled, well-defined positions. And then we quench the lattice down and see what's happening. Um, one uh, important uh, point here that I should highlight is that, um, or point out at least, is that in this case, what we do is we uh, uh, bump up the, uh, the on-site interaction just to make the system a bit simpler um, so that we only have to consider the two energy scales, J, the hopping, and the extended range interaction and understand what's going on in that case. And uh, so what we see when we do that experiment um, is shown here. So now what we do is we look at these initially prepared sites, and then we just let go um, and see how they evolve as a function of time. And um, we vary the interaction strength um, um, you know, from um, shot to shot. And so what you can see is basically for very small interaction strength, you see a characteristic light cone spreading here of those two atoms, which is a consequence actually of the fact that they are these hardcore bosons now, so they effectively fermionize and have a ballistic spreading. And you can see that this kind of persists. But in addition, what you see when your uh, V over J is large enough is you see an inner light cone emerging. So you see a second time scale here that is uh, not there when you don't have the extended range interaction. And this can also be indicated with these dashed lines. And you see that this light cone becomes slower and slower as we increase the V, the extended range interaction. 
And the question is now what's going on here, and we can actually understand this. It's, it's, it's sort of well known from on-site interaction uh, um, um, experiments that have been done for quite a while. What we see here is essentially the emergence of bound states between these two atoms which are bound because they're in a, a bounded spectrum here of this 1D lattice. And uh, the reason why they're bound is in the end that uh, uh, the extended range interaction actually lifts this uh, state that we, that we prepared as initial state um, out of the continuum, the scattering continuum, and so these, these, uh, this object can actually only propagate as a bound object because the two atoms cannot release the energy, the extended range Hubbard, uh, um, or extended Hubbard energy into the scattering continuum and propagate as free particles. And we see both of the light cones in the end because the initial state doesn't have perfect overlap with the bound state, but it has uh, significant overlap. And um, this is well known, this physics, um, from uh, when you take just a standard Hubbard model and you prepare two atoms on the same side, you get the same, uh, the same uh, phenomenon. You can actually get bound states between two atoms that are repulsively bound because they cannot release their on-site interaction. So this is the analog for the extended range interaction here. Um, there can still be dynamics, of course, of these bound states because they can couple via the scattering continuum um, um, uh, to hopping over by one side. And what happens here is basically one atom can hop um, uh, which costs you an energy of V, and then the other one can follow. So the dynamics that is expected here is a J squared over V uh, dynamics, and we can just extract this uh, J squared over V um, as the effective time scale of propagation from our light cone, and it matches, um, it matches the, so the experiment matches this expectation that it's a quadratic growth um, of the speed with which these, uh, these magnons, these bound magnons spread, or these bound states spread. I already actually uh, took away the punchline, so I just said bound magnon, so you can actually show easily that the system maps to an XXZ model, and what we observe here is, uh, um, can also alternatively be viewed as a bound magnon state between two spins. But uh, the repulsively bound pair picture is uh, equally valid. The second experiment, as I said, would be to uh, uh, try not to do a quench where we kick the system, but to do things more gently. Um, and uh, what we need to do here is we need to be um, very careful in ramping um, interactions and ramping the lattice down. And so what we start with, um, first of all, is a state where we confine the atoms in this 1D chain. In this case, we actually work with um, about eight or nine atoms per chain. And uh, then we adiabatically release them to populate the full one-dimensional lattice. We put uh, boundaries at the edge so that they cannot escape. And uh, we do this in a way that we uh, realize close to the ground state of this system at this point in the absence of extended range interaction. And then what we do is we ramp up this extended range interaction slowly, um, just increasing the V in a linear fashion over time. And what you can see is um, what we start with here first on the left-hand side is a state where you don't have extended range interactions and things, were, you know, things can basically propagate freely and um, uh, you know, basically the atoms are distributed equally. What's plotted here, I should say, is essentially the density-density correlation, so the probability of finding two atoms um, next to one another um, or at larger distances. So the distance here actually implies uh, or it, it characterizes the, the extended range character of the density-density interaction. And so you see this is uh, flat if you don't have extended range interaction, which means it's equally likely to find, you know, given an atom at some site, another atom somewhere else. But then when we start ramping up, or doing this linear ramp of the interaction, what we find is we get a suppression of the density-density correlation for two neighboring atoms, which means they start repelling each other. And conversely, we find that uh, if you go one side over, so the next nearest neighbor correlation actually assumes a positive value. So this is sort of like this onset of, of an ordering, if you want. And we see that this emerges uh, and becomes stronger and stronger. And you can even you know, uh, um, dream of a, a second minimum here, which would kind of then imply this density ordering um, that, uh, that you have in these systems. And we can also quantify this, uh, basically just uh, looking at the strength of this uh, nearest neighbor correlator, and you see it goes down and down and down as a function of V, whereas the next nearest neighbor correlator goes up um, as a function of this strength. And again, what this is reminiscent of, and this is of course only to give you a picture, it's not what's actually happening in the system, because it's very different uh, in terms of the, the, the underlying Hamiltonian, but it's a bit like this ordering picture, that the long range interaction now pushes the atoms and, and, um, and pauses them to order. All right, so um, what this shows is actually um, that uh, we, we can now realize using Rydberg dressing these longer range, these extended range interactions, and we can actually also do nice quantum simulation experiments understanding microscopically what happens, first of all, in terms of these 
uh, bound states that form, but also in terms of the, um, you know, the, the many body physics that you get in such one dimensional systems. And we are still trying to understand uh, um, those systems better. For example, how the uh, non adiabaticities, for example, in SRAM can modify things. And of course, this is just a, the first experiment that has, uh, I think, um, demonstrated that you can do this uh, Rydberg dressing in these uh, quantum simulators. And we are, we are happy also to think about new ways that you can use this uh, temporally controlled interaction um, that you have via this uh, um, light, admixed, uh, light admixture in this case. All right, um, so now I wanna uh, take a step back uh, and uh, think about a slightly different platform um, that we've built or presented a slightly different platform that we have built in Munich um, that ultimately has similar goals like this, uh, this experiment that I showed, namely to do quantum simulation of microscopically controlled atoms. However, what we wanna do here is we wanna bring together um, these two platforms. So we wanna build a, um, a setup that uh, has um, aspects of this quantum gas microscope, namely the optical lattice, and also unifies this with the microscopic control you have in these freezer experiments, where one thing you can do is you can, for example, move around atoms and bring them in arbitrary geometries. This is something that hasn't been done so far in these quantum gas microscopes. And I think this combination of platforms or combination of techniques is on the one hand challenging, but on the other hand, it also has many, many uh, interesting perspectives in realizing new systems and also just getting access to new ways of doing, uh, uh, of doing experiments in these systems. Um, this has also been realized by other people, um, of course, so um, um, there's been a beautiful um, um, a series of works out of the um, Gila, um, out of Adam Kaufmann's group, where they started putting together optical tweezers to controllably place atoms in optical lattices and then even look at a coherent spreading um, of, these, of these states, um, doing this for single atoms, but by now they've also done it for more than single atoms. Um, conversely, there have been some um, experiments that, uh, that combine optical lattices and tweezers to do uh, new lattice geometries. I would say our own work also falls into this category to some extent. And there's been nice experiments also from Basim Barker's group um, trying to couple individual tweezers um, and fermions, especially in these individual tweezers, to get a programmab programmability in your um, Hubbard quantum simulator. So there's a, a number of few um, approaches um, uh, that are on the market, and um, we also wanted to, to offer our uh, approach. And uh, this is what we, what we built. Um, this is an experiment that started a few years in, in, ago in Munich, and by now it's uh, operational. And the idea here is actually to have a strontium-88 machine where we have an optical lattice that in this case is anisotropic, and we have optical tweezers overlapped, and we can use the tweezers, for example, to sort atoms in the lattice. Um, now, uh, why do we actually work with alkaline earth atoms here? Um, well, I think alkaline earth atoms, uh, in our case, again, it's strontium, have a number of interesting applications. They're interesting for quantum information because they have very good uh, um, qubit bases that you can use, for example, to realize quantum computers. They're also good for quantum simulation because they can be uh, well controlled. For example, strontium-87 has many uh, um, 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 magnetic um, substates, uh, nuclear states, actually, so there's um, SUN symmet symmetric um, systems that emerge. So uh, a very rich zoo that is very, uh, you know, uh, um, very nice if you can control it. Um, and of course, there's also this uh, big uh, prospect of doing quantum metrology with these systems, using them in atomic clocks or also in um, atom interferometers and making use of, of their structure. And um, the structure here is actually particularly important. So why uh, many of these, of these um, um, properties actually are connected with the fact that in these alkaline earth or alkaline earth-like atoms, here uh, I depict strontium, you have these uh, two uh, spectral series. You have a singlet series where you have broad optical transitions that are good for cooling and imaging. And then they are connected by a very narrow line transitions into triplet series that you can almost consider as separate, uh, a separate atom that are only weakly coupled and you go, can essentially go from one to the other via these very weak transitions. And that offers a lot of these ex exciting prospects. For example, uh, this very famous optical clock transition um, connects the one zero ground state to the 3P0 metastable state. And this is the basis of all of these optical lattice clocks that are, uh, that are um, uh, uh, operated right now. We also have an experiment um, I should briefly mention in Munich where we look at this quantum information aspect and uh, just to, to prove a point here, um, we can very coherently manipulate these, uh, these qubits here. So this is a, um, driving the clock transition, the one is zero to three B zero transition. Uh, we get like um, gate fidelities of something like 
three or four percent. And we also have recently, and this is just uh, two weeks old, managed to create a, a very coherent Rydberg uh, control, and this is actually not the best. By now, we also managed to get close to 99% in manipulating the Rydberg state here. So this is really um, showing that there can be very coherent dynamics in these systems. All right, so now I want to, uh, however, go back to this uh, combination of lattice and tweezer and show you um, the prospects or the benefit that this platform has. So what we have here is we basically have this optical lattice, and it's actually made in a way that we can directly load the atoms from the mod uh, without any other uh, intermediate stage into this lattice and take an image. And you can see that despite this, we can still very easily resolve individual atoms. And in addition to this lattice, what we can do is we can actually uh, place optical tweezers on top of a subregion of this lattice and, for example, then load the atoms from that tweezer array into the lattice and back. And we have both of these capabilities. In the lattice, we have very high um, imaging fidelity and low loss. During the imaging, we have uh, more than 20,000 trapping size that we can play with. And for the tweezers, we have you know, a very good ground state cooling, and we can also actually use the, those tweezers to rearrange the atoms so we can create fully filled arrays. So when we started this experiment, actually one big question for us was, um, is it possible to load atoms from a magneto-optical trap into an optical lattice in a configuration where, where you can also then directly image them? And um, this is something that we uh, demonstrated last, last year. So basically we can uh, show that in, in such a cloud where we have, uh, I think in this picture, maybe about um, 7,000 atoms or so, we can still uh, say very, very certainly for each and every lighter side, so this is just a zoom in, whether we have an atom on a specific side or not. And we can do this uh, you know, basically by uh, collecting photons from each and every atom and then asking, OK, um, if we have a low photon count and we have a high photon count, how well can we discriminate between these two cases? Uh, and can we say, OK, uh, for a given lattice side, there's a low photon count, and for another, atom, uh, for another lattice side, there's a high photon count, and uh, so um, associate one uh, you know, low photon count lattice side with zero atoms and a high photon count lattice side with one atom. So this is, is not a priori given that this is possible. So there have to be a couple of experimental uh, you know, uh, requirements have to be fulfilled in order to do that. And the second thing that is actually important is that you have to be able to do that without actually losing the atoms in this process. So you want to take an image and you don't want to destroy the system. You want to reuse the system. And we could also show that basically as this um, um, very low loss that we have uh, when, we come, when we take two images of the same cloud and we see how many atoms we lose per shot. Um, and uh, this is uh, just a, a side remark. This is actually done using a new cooling technique that, uh, that wasn't, uh, hasn't been used in the lattice before. And um, that's why this is sort of special, we, that we could show that with this new cooling technique, we can reach these very um, um, low loss and high discrimination fidelity images. Um, there's something else that you can ask, and this is maybe a bit for, for um, the specialists, a bit of a detail, which is that when you load these lattices, do you actually get single atoms uh, in this lattice per, per lattice side? So nothing uh, a priori tells you that uh, a bright spot here is a single atom. And um, what, we can, uh, we, what we can do here is we can actually show uh, basically increasing the, the, the time we load this lattice from the mod. Um, and taking two consecutive images that uh, in the first image, it looks like there's a long tail in these histograms. So basically, there's another uh, count, uh, a peak coming up here that then vanishes in the second image. And this is a very good indication that we only have two, a bimodal distribution with two, uh, you know, two uh, um, let's say, bins that we have to worry about, which means, in this case, zero atoms or one atom. So this was also very important for us that when we load, we effectively also do parity projection in these images. And um, so uh, long story short, uh, what I just tried to convince you of is that uh, we have a system here where we can load directly from the mod into the lattice, and we can load single atoms, um, and we can detect them without losing them. So that's sort of summarizing the, the last few slides. Um, I just want to point out again to connect to the, the, uh, the content of the conference um, to um, uh, one work that was recently done in the group of Monika Eidelsburger, which was actually thinking about and looking at whether you can use uh, machine learning to classify better whether a, a given lattice site is empty or full. So this is a, a, you know interesting application for machine, machine learning as well. And we actually also started looking into this, and we think that this is an important step for us to use this to improve our classification fidelity even further. All right, so um, this is our basic platform. Um, one thing that I promised that we could do, and we actually recently demonstrated this, is we can now start loading such, uh, such um, uh, lattices uh, with individual atoms, and we can now use the tweezers and actually clean up this picture if you want. So what you'll see now in the next picture is uh, what happens if we now, based on this image, use a tweezer and we shuffle the atoms around. 
and you can see basically it's like a, a almost like a vacuum cleaner or whatever. Uh, so basically you can take this this uh, uh, single tweezer and, and kind of uh, form large order arrays. And this is something that's only possible because we can directly load into the lattice, take an image, and then connect this with this. Uh, with this uh, tweezer technology. And uh, prospectively, of course, you can see there are still many atoms left here, so we can scale up these, these arrays even further. We can also pack them more densely, and we have many ideas on also to load uh, the, the initial cloud more densely to actually um, um, scale up the number even further. Okay, um, I have maybe a few, a uh, few minutes, one, two, five minutes even, great. Um, so I can tell you uh, one of the more recent uh, things we did also in this platform, which uh, goes a bit into the direction of asking or trying to answer how we can scale those systems further. So um, the, the point here is we, we usually start our experiments with many atoms. What you see here is a magneto-optical trap, which has, okay, I guess in this case, about a million atoms. Um, and you see down here the microscope that we use to generate those tweezers, and then we have this optical lattice that comes in from the side somewhere. Um, so we start with a million atoms. Uh, everything I've shown you so far was, you know, a few hundred atoms at max. I mean, these big clouds, we have about 10,000 atoms maybe per lattice. Um, but they are at this point still unsorted. So uh, what are the bottlenecks of scaling even further? And um, I would say, maybe this is a non-complete uh, non list or incomplete list, so I'd be happy to hear your thoughts. Um, well, the first one is, well, you have to have the enough Number of, numbers of traps to place the atoms. Uh, this we have in the optical lattice. We have uh, tens of thousands of traps that we can use to place the atoms. The second one, this is actually important. When we do this resorting, there's a lot of computational complexity involved because we have to first process the image, then we have to calculate moves, and then we have to exert, to exert the moves. So you actually uh, take quite a long time to do this resorting, and then you get into a vacu vacuum uh, um, lifetime limit, so you lose atoms before you resort them, essentially. And this is actually quite a severe uh, limit if you want to scale high. And then, of course, what you also need is you need low-loss imaging, so you need to make sure that when you image, you know that your image was correct and you don't, don't lose the, the atoms during uh, your, uh, your or did you, you don't lose the atoms during imaging because you want to know whether there's an atom, whether you can move it, uh, and you don't want to lose it. And of course, you also have to have high imaging fidelity, so you, you need to know with certainty whether there's an atom on a specific side. So I think these are some of the you know, requirements or also the critical steps um, if you want to scale these ordered arrays to larger numbers. And um, what I will present um, in the following, in the last uh, two or three minutes, is a way that we recently um, come up with to actually at least overcome this uh, bottleneck of the resorting time, which involves to actually continuously operate such an array. And the trick here is basically to uh, try and create a mod to load new atoms while we still have other atoms in the system and we can sort of recycle some of the atoms. And what that means, uh, and that's uh, giving away the punchline already, is that when we reload, we only have to move a small fraction of the atoms, nam namely replace those that we lose, and that allows us to build much larger arrays than uh, compared to what we do usually, is, uh, which is to throw away all the atoms and load a fresh sample in every round. And uh, the way we do that here is actually that we use the optical lattice in combination with the tweezers again. The optical lattice now provides this big storage area or the large number of sites, and then we have a dedicated loading zone where, where we have both optical tweezers and the optical lattice present. And the trick here now is that what we can do is we can selectively load the loading area um, without actually loading atoms into the optical lattice via the, the fact that we have a bichromatic uh, trap configuration here. This is a bit detailed. I won't go into, into the, um, the nitty-gritty details on the experiment. If you want to know more about this, ask me. But what is then uh, possible is actually um, to have this storage array to load into the loading array um, to make a new mod. And another trick that we do here in order to keep the storage array alive is actually to use uh, this uh, triplet series in strontium. So we start with the atoms uh, um, in the mod here on the 1S0. And then when we are done, we basically place them into, we park them, so to say, in the 3P0 state. Um, and uh, then we can keep them while we do a new mod onto, on, on this old, uh, on this uh, um, uh, broad transition here. So we can really uh, uh, shelf and park the atoms in this excited state and then reload on this, uh, on this ground state. And like that, we can actually keep atoms in the system uh, essentially forever. And we, we have to combine that, of course, uh, with some resorting that we do. So we have to um, really spatially separate the loading zone from the storage zone. And we use this individual tweezer to move from one to the other and to bring the atoms from the loading zone that is reloaded in every shot to the storage zone. 
Um, here's uh, basically what I already said. Basically, this allows us then to build very large arrays because in every round of this reloading, all we have to do is we have to check which of the atoms in such an array have been lost, and then we have to uh, move them again into the storage array from the loading zone in the places where we've lost them. And so what you see here is the average number or the, the number of loaded atoms per shot, and this is the number that we can maintain uh, um, in, at the same time because we just used these atoms to replace the ones we lost uh, in the big array. And now I can show you a, a video of what this looks like. So uh, when we start the experiment, of course, we start with a small array. We just uh, um, start with a few, a few hundred, and then you can see how we uh, load atoms in every shot. Uh, and then when you know, we take images, we know which of the atoms we've lost, then we move them over, and then the whole cycle repeats. And so we can keep this system alive um, essentially forever. So I mean, here we did 30 minutes, we can do one hour, whatever you wish. And you see this, this physics array stays intact, and the number of atoms here is uh, you know, about 10 times larger than the number of atoms that we load in every shot. All right, um, and I think this is maybe to, to uh, make this point, I think this is really a, a very important step to scale these systems further because this requirement of moving many atoms is dramatically relieved. And you can always make the argument that with this continuous uh, operation, even if you can move more atoms per vacuum lifetime, you can still improve your, your final number of atoms in the system. All right. Um, then very briefly, and this is uh, just uh, wrapping up, basically I want to highlight that we also have another um, uh, system under construction right now uh, in Munich where we are trying to place um, atom arrays in optical cavities, just briefly flashing, flashing the idea. So what we want to do is we want to combine now these microscopically controlled atom arrays with a controlled coupling to the light field. Uh, and in this case, the, the, the main idea is to, to take the photons um, out of the cavity to read out the system. But I think there are many other interesting perspectives to do quantum simulation or quantum information with this system, particularly using the open character of the cavity. Just to flash this, so if you're interested in this experiment, come talk to me. With this, uh, the most important slide uh, is uh, to thank everyone who was involved in this work, in particular the Single Adams team um, uh, working on the Skrutberg dressing, extended Hubbard physics. Uh, Pascal was the leading figure here, and we had a lot of help by Tizian, who's in the audience, and Annabelle uh, Bord from Regensburg. The strontium team is up here. Uh, they've put a lot of work into making the strontium experiment work at a very fast pace, and then the cavity uh, crew is here also working hard to bring this cavity experiment to reality. And with this, I want to uh, end and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Johannes. We have time for questions. I thank you. Very beautiful work. Uh, could you comment a little bit? Uh, maybe I missed it. Yeah. So you have these kind of like streets going on in, to, in your uh -huh. in, in your array, right? It's, yeah. it's most probably due to the fact that you have to move the atoms somehow to the yes. actual places. Yes. So when you when you want to do physics, is this some kind of limitation you have? So uh, so could could you think yes. of like uh, another like structure of these yes. these like. I would say super lattice or whatever yeah, you very, would call very, it of these groups of atoms. Yeah, very good observation. Um, so two points. So of course, ultimately what we want is we want to make use of the, the, the densest filling we can have in the lattice, um, provided that is compatible with the physics we want to study. So maybe you want to uh, use dilute diluter systems, uh, um, so with a spacing that is larger. Here, uh, you are totally right. We actually kept some, let's say, highways open so that we can actually uh, more conveniently move the atoms in. Because what we see at the moment, we're actually limited by how well we can place the atoms in here. And this is limited essentially by our moving tweezer. And we saw that when we leave some highways open, this improves. Now, a technical detail I swept under the rug is that our lattice to start with is actually um, asymmetric. So we have a factor of two larger lattice spacing in this direction compared to the other direction. And this is on purpose so that we have kind of these highways naturally built into our lattice. So we can do that, uh, like potentially when we, when we improve the resolution we have, uh, we can uh, essentially fill the full lattice making use of these naturally occurring highways if you want. Uh, in terms of the physics, um, sure, I mean, okay, now uh, giving you the, uh, the application of quantum computing, you can think of these groups as sort of some logical qubit or what you want, and then you have like many copies of the same system. And the same goes for any quantum simulation. You, you have like, you know, uh, I don't know how, these, how many these are, it's six by 13 or so, uh, copies of the same system, you can massively speed up your data rate for small scale quantum simulation. Any further question?
Um, when you uh, like this continuous mode of operation, uh, would that also mean that in the end you can reach much higher uh, repetition rates of your experiment? In the end, like is that also one yeah. key aspect of it? Yes. So this was our original um, idea. Basically, um, at the moment, uh, this is uh, our repetition rate is technically limited in this respect. Um, because of what I said, it's actually for us, we need to essentially reconstruct the filling here, uh, and because we have not optimized our code and it's written in Python, this at the moment takes about 500 milliseconds, which is longer than the time to reload the entire system. But uh, perspectively, you are totally right, so that's one point. Um, and of course, I should say, the scaling um, of the atom number, I would say, is actually the bigger point here, because um, there's, like, if you, if you prepare the system afresh every time, then you have, you know, you load n atoms, you can make an n atom array at max. Yeah? Uh, whereas here, we can essentially get a scaling factor that is not far from optimal in our case, and it's 10, and I'm pretty sure we can push this by an order of magnitude. So if you load 100 atoms, it should be possible to maintain arrays that have 10,000 atoms, uh, in, like, uh, continuously. And um, so uh, to answer, like, your question, um, at the moment, so perspectively, yes, you can also probably improve the cycle time because the larger you make the arrays you directly load, the longer it will take to resort them. And there you are, you know, this, this, this enhancement factor also plays in directly. Um, but we have not done it yet because of technical limitations at the moment. But we are working on improving this. And I'm very confident that this will, this will scale very rapidly. Yeah. Uh, do you have an um, uh, idea, like, how much you might win in terms of uh, repetition yes. rate or cycle time? So, yes, so um, what we estimated is that, uh, so cycle time, I, okay, this I have, to, uh, I have to think about. So there, uh, again, the question is how fast can you reconstruct such, ima such images, basically? Um, so I would say probably we can go to, uh, to cycle times of um, uh, two to 300 milliseconds at max uh, and load, uh, uh, you know, essentially almost 10,000 atoms at that rate. Um, yeah, so, uh, but we have to show that, so I think this is, yeah. but I, I, I'm quite optimistic. So, everyone doing machine learning here, please make this faster and then we can proceed faster. Um, like, can, you, can a tweezer also load a doublon or it's always a single? Uh, ah, <coughs> very good question. So this was what I tried to show. I think I, I glossed over this too fast. So in principle, when we load the mod, the mod, is you know everywhere, and uh, it's very well possible that you load more than one atom per per tweezer, or in this case per lattice side. Like locally, a tweezer and the lattice side in this case look very similar. And uh, usually, we want to stay with one atom because, or we want to end with one atom, I should say, because that's a very well defined sta start um, um, starting point for many other experiments. And essentially, you know, it's a way of reducing your entropy that you don't have this uh, this uh, uncertainty of how many atoms you have per tweezer. Um, and it turns out that in this case, uh, when we take an image, uh, we actually effectively reduce or remove all higher occupations from the system, so we end up with zero or one atoms. If we don't, if we, we detune or tune, your, tune our imaging in a specific way, uh, um, away from the optimal point, we can also load more atoms than one, but it would have a Poissonian statistics or some statistics that is, I don't know, depends on the exact parameters, could be some, somehow squeezed, but it would not be that we can prepare exactly two atoms per side deterministically just by loading. But of course, we can use a tweezer and move two atoms on top of one another and yeah. with some tricks, um, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. <coughs>